Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I hope you've all been keeping well. This week, we've got another incredible guest with us. We've got with us Harish Shueb, who is the CEO and founder of Nutrients Tree, a startup dedicated to AI transformation at scale in health and care. Not only that, he's a consultant, clinical scientist at Guys and St. Tommy's, which we love, not because we trained there, but it is an incredible hospital as well as becoming a director of the Clinical Artificial Intelligence Fellowship. This is incredible. We've been waiting to have you on the show for a while, but a lot of our guests will be thinking, what on earth is a clinical computing scientist? What are these terms? What are these roles? So we'd love to kind of talk about that phase of your career, your journey, and then go into kind of the origin of Newton Street. Yeah, no, happy to. Uh, thanks guys for, for having me on and uh, letting me join the conversation. Yeah, it's, it's not surprising. I spent most of my early career in the NHS, telling people what exactly my job role was, including people in my own organization. So by background, I'm a medical physicist. So as in my, my undergrad training is in theoretical physics, um, actually medicine or healthcare was nowhere near on my radar until I came across a few projects and realized, oh, actually you can uh, use physics to, to impact healthcare. And so I trained as a medical physicist initially working in MRI specifically. So a lot of people don't know that there are physicists running around in the hospital. And I guess in the broadest term, physicists are used in areas where you're using technology like radiation, subject matter experts to support the delivery of that technology. And that can be everything from sort of specification and commissioning all the way through to, you know, designing rooms that are going to hold linear accelerators for radiotherapy to sort of image analysis, like all of those physicists sort of scattered all throughout that sort of pathway, specifically specialized in MRI physics. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, whenever the hospital um, was interested in setting up a new MRI scanner, we'd be involved in architectural drawings, making sure that the room was safe, secure from a magnetic field perspective. And like I said, all the way to image analysis. And actually, that's mm -hmm. where my sort of transition into computer science and AI sort of happened. So I was getting increasingly involved in image analysis end of my job, love developing software. As part of the scientist training program, which is sort of like the grad scheme for, for physicists or for scientists in general, um, you get to do an elective. You know, most people go abroad, go to whatever, Southeast Asia for their elective. Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw a job posting for an MRI physicist at startup and I was like, this is weird. I was like, one, you never see jobs for MRI physicists and you definitely don't see it at a startup. And so this was a Y Combinator startup um, wow. mm. and they were doing something super interesting. They were um, imaging healthy people. So you'd go in, you'd get a whole body scan. Now it's becoming more popular. This was back in 2015. Essentially a, a bunch of engineers, a lot of ex-Google engineers, and I was the medical imaging expert. They would send me around to set up the imaging protocol, these scanners, for their customers to get scans, and they would build... AI algorithms to do image analysis so that when that customer went home, they would see sort of a, an avatar of themselves and see the body composition and blah, blah, blah. And it was through that experience that I learned how to code basically or code properly. I went back into the NHS with the other four days a week and I was like attacking this imaging analysis problem and I got sort of more involved in, in AI techniques from there. The thing that sort of like was a real the rear turner for me was I developed an algorithm around hypoxic ischemic infants, so measuring the lactic acid in these newborn baby brains, but I didn't have a good way of integrating it within the clinical workflow. The way it would work, which is not going to be a surprise to the listeners, was one of these babies would be born, I would get an email, you know, okay. Harris, baby such and such is born, can you come collect the data? And I would walk from my desk at Tommy's to the Evelina, which is next door, with a USB yeah. stick. Yeah. And I would you know, <laughs> stick it in the scanner, download the data, walk back to my laptop in Tommy's, run this algorithm, then email the PAX team, you know, dear PAX team, can you please attach this? Blah, 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 blah. And uh, that would take like two hours round trip. And I was like, I can't do this for the rest of my life. And now with my sort of newfound coding skills, I was like, how do I automate this? Mm. And so I built a little server. I deployed my software and I, and I said to the radiographers, like, next time you scan one of these babies, don't call me or, or email me. Just send it to this location. And then 30 seconds later, look at your computer and the results should be there. Oh, wow. And before I did this, the average time to result was about 24 hours. So if a, and, you know, if a baby was born on a Friday afternoon, 
the parents wouldn't have an idea of the prognosis until Monday, Tuesday lunchtime when I would sort of rock back in. But after I had automated it, it's time to resolve to 30 seconds. So now wow. the prognosis of the baby before the baby was taken out of the stand. What I had ended up having built was the precursor for Newton's tree. Amazing. Those images, who was interpreting or reporting them? Was that using the algorithms and the AI rather than having like a re- radiologist per se? So it was assisting, it was assisting the radiologist and the neonatologist. Um, okay. So it's essentially an extra data point. Um, to with the because it was in a very serious condition. Some of these, some of these babies survive fine. Some of them survive with a permanent neurological deficit, and some of them don't survive the first six yeah. months of life. Um, and you can imagine, like a, a big part of that is communicating the the condition to the parents. And like I, with my firstborn, everything worked out fine. He's a healthy boy now, but it was a bit of a complicated birth started getting sort of flashbacks to my work here, my mm-hmm. work that I did back then. Even minutes of uncertainty as a parent or an expectant parent are really stressful. And so imagine waiting a weekend and not knowing the long-term condition. Mm, that's incredible. And I've been in a situation that, that weekend is such an awful time. Like when you're dealing with patients or you have admitted patients, tell us a bit more about Nushan's tree at a high level and really keen to get into it, particularly for the kind of the founders, the operators that kind of listen to the pod. As far as I understand, it's kind of this, this middle layer, right? Which allows hospitals to connect with all of these incredible AI startups, big and small, at ease, keep an eye on it all. But kind of tell us the high level of how it works, what you're building. And I recently saw a LinkedIn post you, you reposted that I want to touch on afterwards. Yeah, no, happy to. I mean, so, I mean, at a high level, it, it solves the problem that with solving all those years ago the Ablina, which is how do I integrate an AI algorithm, a piece of software within a clinical workflow in a way that's relatively automated. So that's ultimately what we enable. So we with middle layer that allows a hospital to take a third party product, essentially weave it neatly into their clinical workflow where it takes data from the EHR or an MRI scanner or wherever runs an algorithm over it and send the result to the system that it needs to go to. It solves one of the core problems around AI adoption, technology adoption in general, which is interoperability. And everybody talks about interoperability. And to be fair, there's lots of solutions that try and solve this interoperability challenge. What makes interoperability more complicated in AI is that there's levels to it. So there's there's system interoperability, which is, you know, can we speak to each other? Can we send messages to each other? Then there's semantic controllability, which is like, hey, when I call something, so if I say head CT and you say brain CT, are we saying the same thing? Or is that subtly different, mm. right? Mm. And with data-driven technology, that becomes critical. You can't assume that that's the same thing. And then the, the last layer is organizational interoperability, which is like, do our organizations work in the same way? So I might be a hospital and you're a AI vendor. You work on the cloud with anonymized data sets. I work everything on premise. I have information governance requirements, ways I need to work. How can we work together? Right. And we solve that part of the puzzle as well. But then going beyond that, once you have AI plugged in and incorporating and working, the next question is, is does it actually work? Hmm. Like, is it actually, they like AI is faced with an existential question in healthcare, which is the so what question. Yes, we can detect these things and we can automate this stuff, but so what? Like, what's the impact on the patients? What's the impact on the bottom line? And so a big part of our value offering is helping hospitals evaluate the product and yeah. measure their impact. And then the final component is then sustaining that monitoring long-term is how do you make sure that things are still performant one year, two years down the line when sort of the shine has come off, there's less people excited about it because that's when you really need it to deliver. It's like everything looks great in the first mm. 12 weeks and everyone's really excited. But we need to see sort of long-term outcomes. Yeah. But that's that's Newton's tree in a nutshell. Harris, just to uh, pause for a moment, right? So you talked about how you developed this sort of algorithm, integrated it into your workflow, made everything faster and quicker. Sounds actually like you did this very easily, very seamlessly. So just to talk a little bit about the magnitude of the problem that you faced of integrating software you've built that solves problem that solves problems and to integrate that into the NHS. It sounds like you did it very easily, but it's not. So just if you, if you just talk to us a little bit about the problem. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean it's, it's hard to quantify in my particular use case. But ultimately, I, the best way I can explain was that I 
basically spent the good part of a year coming on Saturdays and Sundays unpaid to try and build this server, basically. But the, the good thing is, and that's the whole value proposition of Newton Street, is that once we've done the heavy lifting, for everybody else, it becomes trivial, right? It's a bit like building a motorway. Once the motorway is built, then everybody can use it. And not everybody has to build their own roads or their own integration. That's what we do. And we've gone through that pain, whether it's building the platform itself or deploying and integrating within a particular institution. Once we do that heavy lifting, we then let everybody benefit. Um, yeah. And I'm not, like, typically, like if, if you were to quantify it in sort of general terms, like if if an AI vendor or a hospital wants to deploy some of these technologies themselves, it can take them anywhere between six to 18 months to, to wow. deploy in an NHS hospital. And it will cost you something on the order of 20 to 50,000 pounds in enterprise IT costs. So just the, the NHS organization themselves, in terms of all the person hours and the other costs around uh, spinning up servers, configuration changes, all of that sort of adds up, right? And you have to do this with each vendor that you deploy. That works up for both sides. And as startups, that delay can be lethal. But if you're deploying via Newton's tree, you can deploy a new AI algorithm within the clinical workflow in 60 minutes. Wow, that's, that's instead incredible. Instead of six months. And that's great. It costs you about £100 in staff time versus almost 50000 That is... Um, like it's, it's the the best way to think about it is to think about your life before the smartphone. Yeah. Like if you wanted to listen to music, you buy a Walkman, go to HMV, <laughs> get some headphones. You know, if you wanted navigation, you got to go to TomTom, go to Halfords. You know, like yeah. SD card, whatever. Got to get mm. a European SD card to get European maps for your French France journey. But now you have an iPhone. You go to any country you want, you hook up with CarPlay and you're like driving and it, it's really like night and day. And in the same way, like I was, I was on a call with a health system this morning, um, an international one, and they were like, it's too good to be true. This sounds too good to be true. Um, that's probably what the iPhone sounded like in the year 2000. No, that's, that's incredible. I love exactly. what you're building because it reminds me of like kind of that infrastructure level, that picks and shovel type of startup, right? You are doing the incredible heavy lifting and hard work and then making life a lot easier for all of these startups. And you are right. You know, we work a lot with the, the farm industry where there's lots of research out there about new medications, product lines, the efficacy, is it good, the style? And we need more of that from these AI companies and startups. And I think what you're building allows that. Tell us if you've had any kind of like obstacles or barriers to kind of deploying it. What were some of the tricky things making Newton Street live? To be fair, I think... We've had a bit of a cheat code setting up Newton's tree in that, you know, myself and a lot of the founding team, we come from a deep heritage within the NHS in that we have a deep empathy for the other side because we've been that person who's been trying to adopt a new technology or a platform or whatever it is. And so we've purposefully designed everything from the technology all the way to the contracts and the pricing in a way that makes it as easy as possible because we know how things can be difficult um, on the provider end. I mean, the main challenge or the main hurdle is really around, one is capacity and capability. Like there's not a lot of organizations for a platform like Newton Street. And again, sort of leaning on the smartphone analogy, you know, for a lot of people, if they're only intending to use a phone to call people, they probably yeah. don't need a smartphone yet, right? And so there's a lot of organizations where they're, they're, that's where they are in their journey in AI adoption, which is fine. Like everybody needs to go on their own journey. And we focus more on those people who are currently walking around with like a TomTom -tom and a Walkman and are exhausted. Yeah. And they're like, I need a smartphone because this is getting tiring. Yeah. And with those institutions, the value proposition comes across relatively clearly. The, and then the, the hurdle when it comes to implementation is just getting staff time because it's it's like healthcare everywhere it's teamwork and so even when we're doing our the deployment of our platform initially which is the initial heavy lift we need to coordinate with you know information governance with it infrastructure teams etc and just like everybody else they're resource constrained they have other priorities but like i said we've tried to design our technology and our contracts and everything to make it easy for all the stakeholders yeah. what's the landscape like in terms of ai adoption in the UK at the moment, where are we on the curve? Well, it's a great question. It's a mixed picture, right? Really mixed. 
So if, if we think about um, what's available on the market, first of all, so there, there's probably almost 500 CE marked algorithms that are available to purchase. So there's no shortage of supply. And mm. in fact, I think part of the problem with medical AI is that there's been an oversupply of AI products, which is a consequence not of healthcare, but of the broader sort of origin story of, of AI. If you if you go back to sort of the early 2010s and we had sort of Facebook and Google using neural networks to find, you know, cats and dogs and images and videos. So a lot of those algorithms like AlexNet got developed and then those same data scientists then turned to healthcare and were like, oh, what mm. can we do? Really the only specialty that was mostly digital was radiology, right? Mm. And so it was like a match made in heaven. Be like, oh, we've got algorithms that can find objects in images and you've got images with like tumors and fractures. Like, let's just make a bunch of those products. Mm. But no one really thought about like the health economics or the fact that this is a mainly a consultant led practice which is really hard to match or improve upon. And so there's been limited uptake of AI, but because I think a lot of it's been supply driven rather than demand driven. And so the average hospital is using maybe one or two of these products in routine care. There's lots of pilots, lots of research happening. I would say off the top of my head, like probably the top hospitals, top in terms of using most AI as part of routine care are probably going to be places like Guys and Tommy's and a few other institutions and really probably on the order of 10 to 12 AI products mm -hmm. on the market. But if you compare it to, say, some US or Canadian institutions that I know of, I know um, Unity Health in Canada, they've got close to 50 AI models in production, uh, right. orders of magnitude difference. But also the models that are seeing more traction are in non-imaging space, especially over the last couple of years. So, especially with the advent of language models, you're seeing a lot of proliferation of language models, right? both for some clinical use cases, but a lot of operational use cases, sort of back office uh, stuff. And, and the other ones are around risk predictors. So okay. basically, and, and that's obviously in a post-COVID world, it's sort of kind of critical. Yeah. Uh, we've got backlogs all over the place yeah. and lots of clinical risk and pressures that arise from those. And so there's loads of algorithms that will, you know, take a chronic diabetes population and say, okay, well, these, this subset is most likely to progress or you've got a, you know, a surgery waiting list. And you're like, well, okay, these are the low complexity patients. Let me send them to a different surgical hub and we'll just deal with the high complexity patients. And so you're seeing a lot of traction with those. The imaging scenarios that have been really successful are in stroke AI. So where you're triaging sort of critical findings, that's where, exactly. where we're at in terms of traction. A lot of the low hanging fruits for people building AI for healthcare around kind of imaging, diagnosis, risk factor tools, because we have a lot of budding founders looking for ideas. Where would you say is the easiest low hanging fruits? Um, and where, what do you think are the big problems, the big challenges that AI can help solve? What are both ends of the spectrum looking like? Yeah, I mean, difficulty on the topic of low-hanging fruit has different dimensions when we're talking about medical AI. Because there's how, how difficult is it to build, how difficult is it to deploy, and how difficult is it to prove value? Something that might be really easy to build, like a radio DAI algorithm, and also relatively easy to deploy, is very hard to prove. So, for example, if we take mammography AI, so that was one of the early sort of darlings of, of sort of medical AI, which was, hey, we have a breast screening program. We have a double reading protocol right for automation of at least one of the readers. We have pre-standardized imaging protocols. So we've got tons of data. So relatively easy to build an algorithm. We have pretty standardized technology for the screening system in terms of PACs and, and the national screening system. So deployment looks easy, but proving improvements in cancer outcomes, not mm. easy. That's not easy, right? And so it, it looks like low-hanging fruit from one perspective. And mm. then you look at the other dimension and you're like, oh, wait, this is not low-hanging fruit. So when we talk about low-hanging fruit, you just think about all three of those things. It is where it's easy to build, easy to deploy, and easy to prove the value. And that's where you're seeing language models really for an operational use cases, right? Because before the advent of language models, it was really hard to do anything with notes and text. So it didn't quite meet the build criteria. It also was really hard to deploy because we didn't have a lot of adoption of EHRs, things like Epic and Cerner. And so it wasn't really easy to operationalize them. 
but the value proposition makes sense. Like if you've got clinical coders or other administrators, administrative staff pouring over notes, yeah, uh, copy pasting stuff, extracting it to in enter into another form, all of that stuff is right for automation. Now with mm -hmm. language models, it's become easy to build. So it's easy to build, it's easy to prove value. And now it's just the deployment question. And that's yeah. why we as the industry are increasingly focusing on language models and risk predictors. Um, because we think if we can solve the deployment problem, which is kind of our bread and butter, then it really unlocks the ecosystem. Going to the sort of the, the user end now, the workforce, right? What's yeah. their attitudes to AI been like? What, where do you think we are with them on the curve of AI adoption? Because I've seen on in the landscape for um, scribes, AI scribes mm. in the GP setting, it seems like the appetite slowly now increasing, whereas before it was like, absolutely not because legal liability and what's going on there. Maybe we can touch on that as well. But yeah, what's the workforce friction points? What's their attitudes towards AI adoption like? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you got it spot on in that it's mixed, but it's trending in the right direction. Mm. Um, well, trending in the direction of more acceptance, basically. Um, that's partly driven, uh, driven by two things. One is that vendors are getting better. Basically, five, 10 years ago, the, one of the big problems we had was we were getting a lot of products that were being poorly communicated and the value yeah. proposition wasn't clear. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a healthcare system problem. The vendors just needed to more or better clinical leadership. And sometimes they had no clinical leadership. And so that's been solved uh, to a large extent. And then the, the other drive is the pressing issues uh, that the healthcare system is dealing with is like we're in a desperate situation. And not, not just not just the UK, not just the NHS. This is health system Lovely. the world over. Read any sort of US healthcare newsletter, and there's hospitals closing all over the place, hemorrhaging money, losing staff, or laying off staff. And so, people are like, automation is really going to become a requirement for a sustainable healthcare system. And so, attitudes have changed. Obviously, with my my other hat on, I run the fellowship in clinical AI, and the purpose of that program was to recognize that we needed to invest in our future clinical leaders so that they were confident in leading that change and the adoption of AI in their local departments or, or regions or whatever the case may be. And, and I think there needs to be more of that. We just recruited cohort three across England, Scotland and Wales, which is fantastic. It's still only 30 fellows across wow. three countries. So it's a, it's a good effort and I feel like the fellows get massive benefit but in terms of solving system-wide problem, it's a drop in the ocean. Yeah. Um, and so that's going to be the other driver of a change in attitudes is more education. No, definitely. I recently saw a, a LinkedIn post you reposted um, about, you know, kind of these big hospitals and providers. You know, it's a pain to kind of being locked into one or two providers, not being able to switch in and out. And you kind of are like, this is exactly what we're building with Newton's tree, right? This kind of app store model where like you can choose, you can build on the efficacy and validate it. Tell us about that idea, what you see the future looking like and why it's so valuable and beneficial. Well, for those of you who've been involved in, in sort of procurement process inside the health service, you, it's, it's not a sort of enjoyable process and it's, it's even more difficult with AI technology where you're not dealing with something that's a commodity or that's super well understood or well defined. And so often because of the constraints of the system and the resources you have, when you're going through a procurement process, you have to prematurely select, right? So if you, if you know you have an issue with, I don't know, emergency room triage and you're like, okay, well, I want to look at the market and deal with vendors, what you would love to do is to pilot all of them or run them mm. all side by side or, or try before you buy all this sort of stuff. But you know that nobody has the time for that. Your IT department is going to hate you. They don't have capacity. And so you're ending up prioritizing too early or selecting too early. And then what happens is, is that you, that project or that procurement process can't fail, right? So say if you select a vendor, you start piloting them and you're like, oh, this is not as good as I wanted it to be. There's a lot of pressure to just power through yeah, to try and just make it work. And it's, and it means that the provider, the healthcare provider doesn't end up getting best value out of that process. And if you compare it to your sort of consumer perspective going back to the iphone like 
I've got, I think, four or five different navigation apps on my phone. I've got Google Maps, Apple Maps, yeah. I've got Waze, yeah. I've got City Mapper, I've got blah, 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 blah. And because it doesn't cost me anything to have all of them on my phone, the unit cost of transacting with those applications is near zero. And it also means that I can become comfortable with all of them and say, oh, actually, when I'm in the UK, I prefer Apple Maps. When I go abroad, I actually prefer this. And it gives you maximum flexibility to ensure that you get the best for your situation. And that's the world we want to bring to hospitals. We want it to become as easy as that, where you say, actually, I'm going to use all of these numbers. I'm just going to run them all in parallel on my data set, whether it's retrospectively or prospectively or whatever. And I'm going to pick what's best for me, and I'm not going to be forced to make an early decision because of some external factor. Because there's, there's no reason why we can't try everything. Then there's no inherent reason. The reason is because of practicalities. And so we want to change the question. We want to say, hey, what if you didn't have any constraints? What if you could switch in and out any yeah. third-party product that you wanted to in 60 minutes? What could you do then in terms of getting value for your patients and for your organization? Yeah, I've been yeah. in the situations... I remember it was Obs and Gaini where they brought on a new piece of software or kit and the best thing came out soon after. But because they're in this long procurement process, this long, you know, contract, like the budget's been spent, we can't do it. We know it's good. You know, now we just have to get on with it. Like, and it's just stifles innovation. It stifles the care you're giving. And it's, it was frustrating. And then, you know, the new thing had prescribing and this one didn't. So we exactly. were doing drug charts and software. And it, it was just this. It was because that process was so arduous and difficult and they were stuck they had to make it work they had to power through and we were losing out on so much from a patient care as well as the workforce yeah exactly and 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 even even if things went well like so even if if there wasn't a better competitor and this was the best solution let's say once you're getting to the end of the contract then there is now a better vendor right? exactly then you're like okay i want to switch but like oh no i've set up all of my processes and all of my integration points with this vendor, if we pull them out, then the whole service has to stop. Exactly. And then, then you're like, oh, we can't pull them out. Whereas with Newton's Tree, because we handle all of those integration points, you're free to plug people in and out as you wish. And, and also the question that people then can challenge me on, on Newton's Tree is, well, what if we want a different AI platform? Then all we're doing is just shifting the problem. So I thought about this like long and hard and we did it and even when we were developing the technology and our integration engine and our workflow engine is built on open source software. Mm. So you can take out Newton's tree and put another platform on top and none of your workflow is broken because I mm. don't believe that a good healthcare business should defend itself or should build a successful business on vendor lock-in. Like if you have to lock yeah. in your customers in order to have a sustainable business, then I'm not sure how valuable you are to the ecosystem. I want customers to stay with me because we deliver exponentially more value than anyone else can, not because it's a pain to get rid of me. Like nobody wants to be that person. I'm yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, like it reminds me of the, do you then become sort of a, a monopoly like the app store where, in the beginning, it's all well and good. You're supportive of all the different startups. Then when things get a bit more serious, you can pick and choose on that search, you know, certain AI algorithms for breast cancer, or whatever, to come up first versus the one that's 100 from the list, right? And then what you yeah. talk about, open source, they can shift. Even, even Newton Street can be plugged in and out. Kind of helps that kind of explain that situation. Yeah, no, exactly. And we take the neutral bits in our tagline very seriously. So we don't have any exclusivity agreements with any of our vendors. Um, if a vendor wants to sell to a Newton Street hospital directly, even if they're on our marketplace, they're free to do that. We don't get involved or, or put any barriers mm. to that. Because in the end of the day, we want what's best for the health system. Yeah. And if we're not making it easier, then we are the ones that need to innovate and make ourselves yeah. more attractive as a, as a way of deploying it. And we've also just hired a head of AI governance and policy who's going to make sure that all of our internal policies and processes ensure that we stay committed to that aim and mission. So you're clearly making deployment incredibly, incredibly easier for startup founders who are building AI-based products. I mean, it's a no-brainer. If I'm building something now, I'm coming to Newton Street and say, hey, hey, help me deploy this. So where, do, where would you advise their focus shift to? So if you're building a product, you're usually thinking, okay, distribution, getting it in. But then if you're solving that problem, and I'm building this AI tool for the healthcare service. 
where would you say, what other things should I be focusing on? Regulation, compliance, what other things are there for us? Yeah, I mean, so things like regulation and compliance are sort of like a given. That's table stakes. You should be doing that anyway. But if you want to differentiate yourself, you need to deeply understand the clinical pathway or operational pathway that you're affecting. Deeply understand your evidence generation strategy. So one of the mistakes that a lot of vendors have made to date, particularly startups, is they've thought themselves more like consumer app companies. Like a lot of these AI vendors think that they're like angry birds or something like that. When actually you're more like a drug, right? Mm. And and what do we know about drug companies is that they have to spend a lot of money and time on evidence generation, clinical trials, proving safety and efficacy. That's where they need to focus. Because ultimately, once we solve the deployment challenge for you, the only thing stopping your hospital from using and procuring your solution is one, whether the new pathway makes sense and is safe. And secondly, that they have confidence that it's going to be safe and effective. And that can only come with evidence. And so that's where I would advise people to focus. I think that is the perfect way to wrap up this episode where a lot of time, effort and resources is just convincing these hospitals to not even give you a paid contract, just a pilot to test it. Whereas you come in and you solve that, you give kind of this autonomy, this, this neutrality as well. And I do agree, digital health, all of these startups are going to have to kind of follow the suit similar to pharma companies or drugs. What is the clinical evidence? Is what you're proposing better than what is already in existence? What does that look like? Is it actually helping save lives? And if you can free up their time to do that, it makes I mean, sense. I mean, Newton's tree makes that one big problem go away. So I think everyone's a lot happier. <laughs> all the founders in the room. <laughs> That's the end. No. <laughs> But no, thank you, Harris, for taking the time out to to jump on this. We really enjoyed it a lot. We learned a lot. I know yeah. what you're building is a bit far-fetched and sometimes it does feel too good to be true, but you're giving us that real insight. Um, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners and founders that are building AI products and tools for clinicians and the workforce will be interested to learn more. So I'm going to link it below. And then can anyone list the solution onto the marketplace or how does that work? Did they need to reach out to you? Yeah, I mean, just go to the website. Uh, send us a note on the contact form. We don't have a listing fee. There's no upfront cost or anything like that. Um, Amazing. Some vetting processes and then you're on the marketplace. Amazing. Perfect. Awesome. We'll share that then. But no, thank you so much, Harris. We'll speak to you soon. Thank you, Harris. Thanks to all our listeners. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.